Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, thank you. Very kind. Uh, so when when we started this evening, I, I explained to you, I tried to explain the uh, the idea behind the show that um, it was a, a really a, a question of trying to relive this uh, journey we'd shared together. And um, so I've told you a few of the stories behind some of these songs, and um, and I'll tell you some more uh, later on. But uh, I think now is a good time. Uh, I'm going to sit over here, and Dennis and Andre are going to be out in amongst you with flashlights and radio mics. And if anybody would like to uh, <coughs> recount a memory or ask a question, anything you like, um, or say anything you want to. Please uh, don't feel shy. You're amongst friends, okay? Well, here we are then. Great. It's uh, great having you here tonight. Thank you. Playing your music. It's incredible. I was uh, wondering what was some of your inspiration behind the lyrics for Carnival 9, first and third impression? Um, you know, that's the album there. And, um, but how, it, how it came about really was that we, the, the album we made just before this was called Trilogy. And when we, thank you, when we made it, um, recording was just changing from 8-track to 24-track. And of course, we, we were uh, very quick to jump in and start using it. We, we used a lot of overdubs, put a lot of overdubs onto the, onto the record. Problem was, when it came to do it live, you know, we couldn't rep replicate all of the overdubs. So we decided that the next album we would make, uh, we would do it we would actually create it live and then record it. So that way there was no question about could we perform it or not, we were performing it. So um, although it sounds very extravagant now, what we did is we bought a theatre in London, cinema actually, and we set up on the stage and we wrote this, this record. And we, were, we wanted to get this, uh, the idea behind it really was some type of carnival. I mean, this is where you get the, uh, the line, um, welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. This is the, the idea behind it was, it was a bit of a circus carnival type of thing, uh, in a bizarre kind of way. Um, as far as the lyrics go, they're not tangible. There's nothing really, <clears throat> I could tell you, it is more about how they sound and the atmosphere that they create. Um, and, and also, they're not really related to this cover, which was, which was kind of retrofitted after the title was, um, was stumbled upon. I believe it, it, it originally came from a Dr. John track, but uh, Brain Salad Surgery was the title, and we met an artist called Giga in Switzerland. He'd done the... Uh, sorry? He'd done the, the film, uh, The Aliens, I believe. And um, so we met him and talked to him, and, uh, and this is what he did. And inside of here, there's this beautiful lady. And apparently, she is a hooker, or was a, was a hooker from Zurich. And Giga was absolutely obsessed with this lady. And every time he would paint a female, it would be her. And so then he took a picture of her skull, he had her x-ray, and that was that, so the, the blend of the x-ray and the, and the beautiful face is what really is very striking about it. It's also very good for sifting seeds. <laughs> Next question. Greg, my name is John. Hi John. I'd like to know about pirates. Pirates, yes, well, we, uh, this was very strange. I mean, this will show you how unrelated songs are and the, the creation of them to circumstances. 
at the time we were living in Switzerland and um, we were recording in a studio there in Montreux and uh, Keith had come up with this piece of music I think he really uh, wanted to, to uh, use it as a film score but for some reason it didn't happen and, but it was a really nice piece of music but it, uh, I, didn't, I asked him what he, you know, what he thought it, it represented and he said well, I, you know, I wrote it really with mercenaries in mind, soldiers you know. and I thought, ah, that doesn't sound like a song to me, you know and then the more I thought about it the more I thought, it sounded like the sea. It had an element of the sea about it. And then I thought, ah, mercenaries, pirates. Pirates, the sea, you know. And um, so we decided that would be the concept for it. And what, uh, what we did, I was writing with Pete Sinfield at the time, what we did is we bought every imaginable book on piracy, every imaginable film on piracy. And we sat up this mountain and we watched and read this stuff for a month until we were completely absorbed and knowledgeable about pirates. And, um, and there were lines like, the captain, rose from, the captain rose from a silk divan with a pistol in his fist and shot the lot from an iron box and a blood red ruby kissed. I give you jewellery of turquoise a crucifix of solid gold, 100,000 silver pieces. It is just as I foretold. This was, the, this was the language of piracy. And it was fascinating, really, because we learned a lot about pirates and the misconception of them. Um, and it was just a fascinating thing to write. I, when we recorded it in Paris, interestingly enough, um, we, we recorded it in Paris in a studio called Pathé Marconi and it was just across the road from the Paris Opera and the day we recorded it, Leonard Bernstein was um, rehearsing the, or the orchestra over the road so um, a friend of ours knew him and uh, invited him to come across and have a listen to Pirates so he came into the studio and uh, I was sat at the recording desk and he walked in and, you know, Mr. Bernstein, and, and very nice to meet you. Please come and sit down. And he came and sat down by, beside me at the recording desk. And I said, well, we've just, we've just uh, recorded this thing called Pirates. Would you like to hear it? And he says, yes, please, play it. Like so I played it, you know, and he put his head in his hands like this. And he goes, it's about 20 minutes long, this please. So he didn't move all the way through. He sat there like this. And at the end, when he had finished, he looked at me and he said, singer's not bad. <laughs> I don't think he even realised I was the singer, you know. But, um, but it was lovely and, uh, you know, I've, I've always, got, I, it's a piece that I've always loved. And although, strangely enough, I think that album, Works Volume 1, was in a way the beginning of the end of ELP. It was, it was not the same sort of music as Tarkas and Trilogy and Brain Salad Surgery. It had gone off in a, in a sort of orchestral direction and in a sort of solo divided direction. But at the same time, it was, I think, a lovely piece of music. Uh, and interestingly enough, <clears throat> I think it was actually unfinished. It always sounds unfinished to me for some reason. But uh, anyway, that's the answer to your question. Thank you. Bravo. Hello, Greg. It's uh, great to see you again. And I just want to let you know that the love that you give through your music is manifest here with my wife, as I asked her during a California Jam 1973. Wow. And Mary during, during, from the beginning. So, you're still in our hearts. Love you always. Thank, Thank you very much. It's a very sweet thing to say. And I remember um, flying over California Jam and looking down and seeing this throng of people that was, one could only describe as being biblical in, in the proportions. I think 
the numbers vary, but, but I think there was somewhere around 300,000 people there. And as if you probably know better than I. But, you know, um, the wonderful thing about it was, is, that it was about sharing. You know, and I think that that's about, that's one of the things about tonight. And one of the ideas behind this show was, it was about sharing. You know, when we, when we bought albums like these, you know, we were young, we used to take them home, we used to sit down with our friends and listen to them together. You know? and, and that's how a lot of people got into graphic art. They would see the album covers, they'd say, wow, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to paint something like that, or I'd like to have that on my wall, or that was an introduction to a lot of people uh, to, to the visual arts, as well as music. But one day, along came the Sony Walkman. <laughs> and music changed from being a shared experience to a solitary experience. You now listen to music with your earbuds in, you know. And that was a change, I think, in some way, of how we all experience music. And what I think was remarkable about the California Jam was that was an expression of the people, by the people, of this feeling of sharing in this voice, which was music. That was the voice of our generation, and we shared it together. Andre. Hi, Greg. Hello. My name's Chuck. Hi, John. Um, the third concert I ever went to was ELP at Madison Square Garden with the full orchestra. Yes. That's been hard to beat. It's been a long time, but it's, it's been hard to beat. That was great. Um, also, the last time you were here, uh, you'd mentioned that Lucky Man was a, at, in your own words, I believe, a simple song that you threw together. That was the first song I ever learned. Oh, really? I was playing a guitar. And it was, I didn't want to hear that, but thank you. That was <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Well, you know, I mean, look, thank you for that. Uh, we all have got. I mean, that's why. That's why I played you um, uh, the Elvis song because uh, we all start somewhere. You know, everybody starts somewhere. And um, uh, I, I, like you, I picked up. Uh, I picked up the guitar and the first thing I did was I tried to learn, you know, what other people were doing. Funny enough, Steve Lukather told me that Lucky, the solo of Lucky Man was the first solo he ever played. So, you're not alone. Thank you for that. Here we are here. Hello, Greg. Hello. This question is about the song Trilogy, which you performed tonight, the first section. Many of us, for many years, because we heard Keith Emerson playing it on piano, we assumed that he wrote that chord progression. Did you compose it or did Keith compose it? He composed the piano uh, part of it and I composed the vocal. So it was a, it was a collaboration really. And tonight was your arrangement? I just played it on guitar, yes. Yeah, sounded beautiful. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. Andre. This is an honor. Thank you very much. You know, I uh, just wanted to say, uh, man, I'm nervous all of a sudden. No, no, don't be nervous. Uh, I used to climb a few mountains, and the endless enigma was always going through my head. Yes. Anyway, the question I had was, ELP had a song named Brain Salad Surgery. Yes. It wasn't on Brain Salad Surgery, the album. That's so, right. What's the story? Um, I think it was that we, do you know, I've got a job to remember, but I think what it was, was that we had finished the album and it was, it was complete and we had enough material and I think we had just had this song left over and we, uh, I think they wanted us to put it out as a, as a single, but um, we didn't, you know, we weren't really in, into singles that much. And I think in the end, it was, it got given away as some sort of giveaway with a, with a newspaper. And I don't think it was ever formally released. I could be wrong, 
that I think it was something like that, uh, and it was, but it was never included on an album. Very interesting of you to note that. I think I'd forgotten all about it. But I mean, uh, um, it is such a, you know, sometimes you don't really control everything when you make an album. A lot of it is circumstantial. You know, some of the, some of the best things are accidents, really. Uh, thank goodness for them, you know. I, I like to record in a way that leaves space for accidents. Uh, you know, if everything's predetermined and preconceived and pre this and pre that, it's you're just going through the routines. But when you leave room for the unexpected, uh, then, you know, what you leave room for is greatness. And it may not happen, but if it does, it's a wonderful thing. There we are, Dennis. It's an honor to see you here, Greg. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I had a question about your first, I think it's your first CD that came out by yourself with Nuclear Attack on it. Oh, yes. Uh, there's no possibility of uh, improvising like you just said and tightening any of that? Um, I don't think I could do that really off the top of my head because the, that, was, that was made with a great friend of mine, the late Gary Moore. Um, it was actually one of the, it was, it was he who wrote that particular song. And um, uh, sadly, of course, he died um, last year. And uh, it was a real tragedy. I remember Gary, it was funny because he, he would always, he would always walk around with a guitar around his neck, you know. And, and it became, uh, it became almost a, an irritating thing because every time you'd want to speak to him, he'd be fiddling, you know. Oh, Gary, can you stop for a moment, you know? And um, he, he, one day he said to me, you know what, Greg, he said, if, if I walked into a hotel room and on the bed there was a naked lady and a Fender Stratocaster, I'd pick up the Fender Stratocaster. And I, I believe him. I do, I believe him. He was a sweet guy, Gary, and um, funnily enough, there was a, a side to him which uh, very few people ever saw. Gary was Irish, and although he professionally he played the blues and sort of heavy metal, in his private life, you know, he would often start playing Irish music. It was really beautiful. I don't know, you must be familiar with the music of river dance. And Gary would play things like that, you know, and some of them would be absolutely heartbreaking. And I used to plead with him to make a record of Irish music. But um, that was it really, and uh, so, you know, it was a wonderful time. I actually met Gary, uh, I was recording a, a song that I'd co-written with Bob Dylan. It was called I Love You Too Much, or as Bob, Bob would say, I love you too much! <laughs> and um, uh, yes, I finished this song off, and uh, I wanted to have this a really blistering guitar solo on it, and uh, somebody said, you know, you should get to play that, it's Gary Moore. And Gary walked into the studio, he, I'll never forget it, in Abbey Road, and he had a long leather coat on, and he was carrying a guitar case, Fender Strat. Um, you know, he walked into the control room, we said hello. He, uh, he, 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 after he said hello, he went into the main studio, he just put his guitar case down, popped it open, picked up the guitar, put it round his neck, put on the headphones, and he said, could you run the track for me just so I could hear it? And he still had his coat on at this point. And so I, I said, sure, you know. Whenever I do that, I always flip it into record for the very reason I said just now, that you never know what's going to happen. And I flipped it into record, press play, and it was a one-take thing. He just, without ever hearing it, he was so great, Gary, he just played it, and it was absolute breathtaking recording. And, um, and so that was it really. And, uh, and then uh, after that, we got on so well that Gary actually was in my band for a couple of years. And uh, it was very sad to lose him. And uh, I'll always miss him. But thank you for that question. Thank you. <laughs> and one more over here then, Andre. Hi, Rick. Hey, my name is Joseph. Many years ago, I went to the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. And it was a midnight concert extra, 
and uh, the opening act was Mahavishnu Orchestra yeah. and then you. And I would like to know what you remember of it and what other bands you would say this was, was rock was all about. Well, I do remember uh, playing with them, but I'm not, my memory of it is not too clear to be, <laughs> to be honest. As they say, if you could remember it, you probably weren't there. I mean, um, I mean, the, 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 the incredible thing was that uh, every day with, with ELP was, um, was quite extraordinary. It really was. And we used to play 280, 300 shows every year. And, you know, there was, uh, after a while, you develop a kind of immunity um, to allowing too much of it to come inside, because if you did, you'd probably end up a nervous wreck, you know. Uh, and so, a lot of the things you, you just, you know, glide through, and um, so I don't, but I don't re really remember too much about that. But uh, thank you anyway for asking. Uh, last question over here, Dennis. Where are you? There you are. Good evening, Greg. Hello. Uh, you mentioned uh, Gary Moore. I saw you at the Bournemouth Pavilion. Uh, I was trying to remember what year that was. Uh, but uh, I was wondering, do you ever go and visit Wimborne? Yes, I do. I do. Um, uh, Wimborne, by the way, is, is a little village in Dorset. I told you about Week in the Head, right? In Dorset is a little village. It's actually where Robert Fripp grew up. Um, but I have a lot of friends there. And uh, yes, I do. I, I go back and visit you know, uh, every, every, as often as I can. Really. I like, um, I do a bit of fly fishing, actually. Uh, the and, uh, uh, yes, and uh, so I go down there and I've got my old chums and we all go fly fishing together. That's it. But look, uh, thank you for asking those lovely questions. And if anybody thinks of anything later on and you think, well, oh, I wish I'd have, I wish I'd have said that, uh, if you'd like to post it on my Facebook page, I'll do it while I'm lying in bed tonight. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>